Hello. Uh, we're going to be talking about meniscus preservation strategies uh, from resection to repair to allograft transplantation. I do have some disclosures. So meniscus tears continue to be the most common knee injury that we see and treat, with an annual incidence reported of 61 per 100,000. Back in the 1960s and 70s, open total or subtotal metastectomy was considered standard of care, where a significant amount of meniscus tissue was excised even in the setting of a small uh, tear. As our understanding of the importance of the meniscus to normal knee kinematics uh, and function, we've been focusing on repairing meniscal tears whenever possible and minimizing partial meniscectomy when they're necessary. The meniscus performs a vital function and its loss is definitely not trivial. Since the days of Fairbank, we know that following a, a significant meniscectomy, progressive degenerative changes are the norm. In Pengus's study published in 2012, they looked at a cohort of patients with 40-year follow-up after a meniscectomy and noted a four times increase in the prevalence of osteoarthritis, which equated to a 132-fold increase in the incidence of total knee arthroplasty. It's really a biomechanical issue. We know from studies like this published uh, in 1986 by Baratz and AJSM that following a subtotal meniscectomy, peak torque contact stresses can increase by more than 200%. Similar findings were reported by Cole and colleagues at Rush who performed serial medial meniscectomies in the cadaveric knee. And they found that there was a linear relationship between how much meniscus was excised and the consequent contact stresses in the affected compartment. The basic science of things following a loss of meniscal tissue include, as we said, a decrease in contact area with associated increase in contact stress and pressure. There's remodeling of the subchondral bone plate, basically leading to a stiffer joint. So it's obvious that the meniscus is essential to normal functioning of the knee and should be preserved whenever possible. But it raises the question, is it the tear or the surgery that causes joint deterioration? Well, it's the tear. With or without surgery, in the setting of meniscus pathology, that patient is at risk for the development of osteoarthritis. This was demonstrated in an England study published in 2009 in arthritis and rheumatism, where they had a longitudinal evaluation of a large number of patients um, documenting the extent of osteoarthritis of the knee that was present. In the cohort of patients that had radiographic evidence of knee arthritis, there was a 54% incidence of meniscus tear, compared to only 18% of the patients who had no radiographic evidence of knee arthritis. So basically, in Eglin's study, meniscus tear equated to an almost six-fold risk of knee osteoarthritis being present. So when you have a patient who comes in with knee pain, swelling, and mechanical symptoms due to meniscus pathology, the options for meniscal preservation uh, include partial meniscectomy, leaving the meniscus tear alone, or performing a meniscus repair. With respect to meniscectomy, the technique includes removing loose fragments and inspecting for any altered menis meniscal tissue that will be present. And we, we say this meaning fibrotic, mushy, or soft tissue that you know is not going to be capable of, of providing the normal function that the meniscus is uh, supposed to be doing. We then want to smooth and contour the border, understanding that remodeling uh, may occur postoperatively. I encourage you from a technical standpoint to switch portals and instruments freely to get as direct access to the meniscus pathology that you're treating as possible. You want to preserve the peripheral rim because this is where the circumferential fibers are, are maintained. These fibers are important in converting the longitudinal weight-bearing stresses into hoop stresses that can then be distributed to the underlying bone through the anterior and posterior meniscus route. With respect to the long-term outcomes following meniscectomy, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the literature. What is clear and evident is that the tear type and extent do matter. And what is important to note is that clinical outcomes following meniscectomy often do not match the x-ray findings that you see postoperatively. Most of the longer-term studies that are reported document an 80 to 95% uh, rate of satisfactory results. However, it's important to note that most studies will show a relatively high incidence of post-metastectomy arthritis being present. As shown in Magnuson's systematic review in 2009, there was a more than five times risk of postoperative osteoarthritis in patients who underwent ACL reconstruction and also had a partial medial metastectomy done 
compared to the cohort of patients who underwent ACL reconstruction in the setting of an intact meniscus. What's also important to note is that the, the improvement that you see in the short term will undoubtedly deteriorate over time. As shown in this study out of arthroscopy from uh, back in 1995, while the short-term good to excellent functional results and return to sporting activities were relatively high in their cohort, the numbers precipitously drop off eight years later with respect to the, uh, the positive outcomes and ability to return to athletics. The extent of resection clearly affects both the functional and radiographic outcome after a partial meniscectomy. Chatain showed that increasing meniscus rim involvement increased the incidence of postoperative osteoarthritis and decreased patient-reported uh, functional outcome scores. Whenever possible, you want to maintain at least 50% of the meniscus, because in Higuchi's study, there was significantly improved functional and radiographic outcomes when this was capable of being done. When dealing with uh, older patients with degenerative meniscus tears, the decision-making becomes a little more complex. And this is primarily because of the, the underlying osteoarthritis and chondral degeneration that's often present. In Crevosier's study from 2005, they showed that in patients uh, that had a more advanced radiographic knee arthritis, uh, kelgren lorenz grade 3 and 4, the functional outcomes after partial meniscectomy were significantly poorer than those who had lower grade radiographic uh, arthritis uh, preoperatively. So basically to sum it all up, functionally patients do well after partial meniscectomy, but they're typically going to develop degenerative changes. Degenerative changes, dege excuse me, degenerative tears seem to do worse than traumatic tears, and there's no doubt that function will deteriorate with time after partial meniscectomy. It brings up the next question of, are there tear types that you can just leave alone? And this I would say is, is a much rarer uh, circumstance. Um, the tear types that could be left alone with just observation include partial undersurface tears and small non-displaceable tears. They al also include uh, tears of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, uh, posterior to the popliteal hiatus like you see here. The real key is whether to decide uh, whether or not you feel that that tear is going to bother the patient postoperatively. And if you're going to try and attempt any kind of treatment, uh, you could consider synovial abrasion or trephination of the tear site with an 18-gauge needle. There is some support in the literature towards uh, leaving certain tear types alone. In Shelbourne's study published in Arthroscopy in 2004, they had more than 200 patients where a lateral meniscus tear was identified at the time of ACL reconstruction. And at more than six and a half years of follow-up, only th uh, slightly more than 3% of this cohort required further surgery and 95% had normal radiographic ratings on postoperative x-rays taken at final follow-up. In a similar study uh, published in 2014 by Lee and AJSM, they had 53 lateral meniscus tears also observed at the time of ACL reconstruction. They were all radial or vertical tears less than one centimeter anterior to the popliteus, and only two of the patients out of 53 required reoperation uh, for postoperative symptoms. 28, uh, 28 of the patients underwent second look arthroscopy for healing as part of the study, and the authors noted that 21 of the small tears had completely healed, 5 had partially healed, and 2 looked the same as they did at the time of the index ACL reconstruction. So what about meniscus repair? We know that certain tear types are amenable to healing, and those are the ones that are, are present within the peripheral 20 to 25% of the meniscus in that red, red vascular zone. They typically, uh, we want to perform meniscus repair whenever possible in younger patients, those with acute tears, and those with large radial tears of the lateral meniscus because we know that they don't do well over time. So when considering meniscus repair, you want to evaluate the tear site and define whether it's stable or unstable. It's unstable if the, menis if the torn meniscus tissue is displaceable or sublux subluxates into the compartment. If it's displaced, you want to make sure that you can anatomically reduce it, and then oftentimes I'll re-displace the tear to evaluate the location and the tissue quality uh, that's present. We then want to really prepare the tear site to optimize the likelihood of healing. We debris the loose fragments, we rasp the tear edges and meniscal capsular junction with the instrument as you see in the image on the top, 
that we're then going to perform a suture repair using uh, either an all inside, an inside out, or an outside in, with sutures placed on both the top and bottom of the meniscus to provide for a stable, balanced repair. It's really dealer's choice with respect to the technique, as many studies have shown comparable results and similar fixation strengths. To review each of the approaches, uh, here's an example of an inside-out repair. This utilizes zone-specific cannulas, as you see here, and long, flexible needles. You do it does require an accessory a posterior medial or posterior lateral incision, and you need to insert either a surgical spoon or a Henning retractor to protect the, protect the posterior neurovascular structures from injury. Inside out is good for the posterior two-thirds of the meniscus. Uh, I typically use uh, this technique uh, for repairing bucket handle tears uh, or to fix the peripheral aspect of a meniscus allograft. It can be hard to get very far posterior or very far anterior with an inside out approach. And when you have a difficulty getting the angle that you would, would like, you should consider utilizing accessory portals. So here's an example of a vertical longitudinal tear fixed with uh, vertical mattress sutures uh, in inside-out fashion. The next approach is outside-in, and this is good for the mid to anterior one-third of the meniscus. It can be difficult to utilize this technique uh, more posteriorly. Uh, the steps are localizing the joint line, making a small incision, and then passing suture through spinal needles placed at, at two different sites. You then retrieve the uh, past suture through your portal. You could pass a second suture, which you then tie together and shuttle through the meniscus. This shuttling allows you to place the loop of suture over the meniscus tear with the tails on the outside. You then tie the two tails over the capsule, uh, finishing your outside in repair. What most of you are probably uh, most familiar and comfortable with is the all inside approach. And there's a variety of different options. Pretty much every company has their own version of an all inside meniscal repair device. Uh, what I'm most comfortable with uh, is the uh, device you see at the image on the top. The benefit of an all inside meniscus repair is that there's no incisions necessary uh, outside the portals that are, are placed for standard arthroscopy. There's no need for knot tying and it's very good for the posterior two thirds of the meniscus. So here you can see um, vertical mattress sutures passed with an all-inside technique, uh, fixing a, a peripheral uh, longitudinal tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. The next question that always comes up when discussing meniscus repair is when and what to use with respect to adjuvants. For me, uh, I like to consider a limited notch plasty or microfracture of the notch uh, when a meniscus repair is performed in isolation. There are other uh, surgeons out there that are using fibrin clots or PRP as an adjuvant. The idea uh, with PRP is subsequent to your meniscus repair, uh, you dry the, the knee of all the arthroscopic fluid and then inject the tear site uh, and fill the, uh, the joint with uh, platelet-rich plasma. At this point, um, with respect to these various adjuvant options, the efficacy is unclear. The concept is we're trying to provide a scaffold for healing with the uh, with uh, increasing the amount of growth factors, chemotactic and mitogenic stimuli uh, at the uh, tear site to increase the likelihood of repair. Here's an example of utilizing a microfracture all in the notch to generate bleeding. So when you have your patients in the office and you're discussing uh, failure rates and time to failure, uh, what are good guidelines? Is it 10 months, 10% uh, incidence of failure at six months post-op? a 20% incidence uh, one year after surgery, 30% incidence of failure two years after surgery, 40% at three years, or 50% or five years. So the literature, as I'll show you, uh, indicates that there's an approximate 30% failure rate of meniscus repair, and it can occur as far out as two years uh, postoperatively. So the conventional wisdom with respect to meniscus repair is that a repair performed in the setting of an ACL reconstruction is going to do significantly better than an isolated meniscus repair, and that isolated repairs have upwards of a 40% failure rate. Most of the systematic reviews out there with uh, follow-ups of greater than five years show failure rates in the range of 30% at a mean of approximately two years. So unfortunately, you're never really out of the woods with respect to uh, meniscus uh, repairs. But what's interesting is that the data shows that the 
success rate is the same for isolated meniscus repairs, those performed in conjunction with an ACL reconstruction, and whether a medial or lateral meniscus is being treated. As an example, here's a study uh, that looked at uh, 10 years of follow-up for patients that underwent meniscus repair at the time of an ACL reconstruction. The outcome in this cohort were similar to patients who underwent ACL reconstructions in the setting of an intact meniscus and were significantly better than those who were treated with a metastectomy at the time of their ACL surgery. There have also been studies that directly compare meniscus repair to partial metastectomies. And at 8 to 10 year follow-up, these studies uh, show that there's an increased return to activity and sport and a lower progression of arthritis, especially in younger patients, in, in those who underwent meniscus repair compared to excision of any meniscus tissue. However, this benefit comes at a cost of a higher reoperation rate. In these studies, it was 23% in the meniscus repair uh, group compared to 4% in the partial metastectomy group, basically treating uh, those patients whose uh, repair fails at some point in the postoperative period. So to sum up meniscus repair, uh, good to long-term functional outcomes can be seen in the setting of healed repairs, and the progression of postoperative osteoarthritis is going to be less in a successfully healed meniscus tear uh, than that would be seen following a partial meniscectomy. The method of repair that you choose to utilize is less important than the meticulousness of your technique and the stability provided to the meniscus tear site. Once again, uh, recommending that you utilize sutures both on the superior and inferior aspects of the meniscus tear to provide a stable, balanced uh, repair. But it's important to note, and when you're discussing the uh, operation with your patients, that the failure rate can be upwards of 30% and can occur after two years or more. So what I'm hoping to get across here is I'd like you to be aggressive with your repairs. In my opinion, it's still a more conservative course than just excising a sizable amount of meniscus. And worst case scenario, you rescope for a failed attempt at repair. So what about the patients whose tear can't be fixed? And this is definitely a clinical dilemma. You have a young active patient who comes in with activity-related pain and swelling following a meniscectomy. And you know from an evaluation of their uh, arthroscopic photos from their index surgery that the articular cartilage in that affected compartment is intact. We also know that there's a poor natural history of the meniscectomized knee. So it raises the question, well, what's the next best treatment option? So while you may consider an unloading osteotomy if the patient comes in in malalignment, I think most of you would agree that an arthroplasty of any kind is not going to be ideal in your typically young active patient population. So it raises the question of the role for meniscus allograft transplantation. The rationale for meniscus transplantation started showing up in the literature in the mid-1990s uh, with studies like this one published in the journal of knee surgery, where the authors demonstrated a uh, relatively normalization of contact stresses in the affected compartment in the setting of a meniscus uh, allograft transplantation compared to the metastectomy state. Here's a list of the current uh, indications and uh, factors considered with in patient selection for those considering meniscus allograft transplantation. It's typically a younger patient who comes in with compartment pain in the setting of uh, meniscus insufficiency. Comorbidities such as cruciate insufficiency or malalignment should be identified and treated either in staged fashion before the meniscus transplantation or concomitantly with meniscus transplantation. Ideally, the uh, articular cartilage in the affected compartment is intact with no more than a focal area of grade 3 changes present. As our success with meniscus allograft transplantation has increased in the last number of years, the indications uh, have expanded to also include patients who come in with recurrent painless effusions after significant metastectomy and those with evidence of ipsilateral overload or, or progression of early articular cartilage changes. And what I mean by that are... Uh, is evidence of uh, subchondral bone marrow edema or orally, orally cartilage thinning on uh, surveillance MRIs that you get uh, when you're trying to follow or manage a patient uh, with meniscus insufficiency uh, non-operatively. Just like any other patient, uh, you want to take a thorough history and perform a, a complete physical examination when you're considering a meniscus allograft transplantation. Every patient's going to get a, a complete set of weight-bearing x-rays, and any patient you're considering a meniscus transplantation should undergo a set of weight-bearing long leg alignment films, as you see on the right. You want to evaluate the mechanical axis, and any mechanical axis that passes through the 
uh, compartment that you're considering a meniscus transplantation, you really should consider uh, including a realignment osteotomy to increase the likelihood of success following your allograft transplantation. It's also extremely helpful if you're able to uh, get your hands on the arthroscopic images from the index procedure to see not only the extent of meniscus that had been previously resected, but the condition of the articular cartilage in the affected compartment. Once you've identified a patient that you feel is a good candidate for a meniscus allograft transplantation, you need to obtain a sized matched allograft from the tissue bank. Allograft sizing used to be performed using plain films following uh, the Pollard technique based on this study published in arthroscopy, where the width of the allograft was based on the AP radiograph and the length of the allograft was based on the lateral uh, radiograph with 80% uh, of the sagittal diameter for a medial meniscus allograft and 70% of the sagittal diameter for a lateral meniscus allograft. Uh, more recently, most tissue banks are requesting MRI based on this study by Ben Schaefer that showed that while neither method was perfectly accurate, MRI was better at uh, predicting actual measurements of the uh, meniscus for allograft sizing compared to the Pollard technique with plain films. Sizing is definitely important uh, because if you have an oversized meniscus allograft, it's going to increase tibiofemoral contact forces, uh, impacting uh, the likelihood of uh, later articular cartilage wear. If you have an undersized graft, there are increased forces seen within the meniscus allograft itself, increasing the likelihood of a tear postoperatively. If you correctly size your meniscus allograft, it allows for restoration of normal tibiofemoral contact stresses. So basically a 5 to 10% size mismatch in both the uh, length and width parameters is acceptable. So here's an example of a, uh, an allograft offer for one of my patients, and as you guys can see here, uh, compared to the patient's measurements, the donor size is within a millimeter, which would be acceptable uh, for uh, utilization uh, surgically. So going over the technique, uh, with respect to patient positioning, uh, you want to paste the patient in a leg holder with the foot of the bed dropped. It's very important to have unfettered access to the posterior medial and posterior lateral aspects of the knee for the repair portion of the allograft procedure. You're going to start with a uh, diagnostic arthroscopy, where you can confirm meniscus deficiency and the status of the articular surfaces in that affected compartment. You're then going to proceed with uh, debridement of the remnant meniscus. You want to get rid of a uh, remnant but leave a one to two millimeter of peripheral rim uh, that you can suture your allograft to. In cases like the images that you see on the top where there's really no remnant meniscus, you'll utilize a meniscus rasp to uh, prepare the uh, capsule uh, for a, to have a uh, bleeding tissue bed uh, for allograft incorporation. So there's a lot of methods with respect to how to uh, implant a meniscus allograft. And for all of my uh, meniscus transplantations and, and a portion of my isolated medial meniscus transplantations, I like to utilize a bone bridge technique like you see here. The benefit of a bone bridge technique is that it maintains the anatomic relationship between the anterior and posterior horns of the meniscus. There's a, a variety of different uh, surgical techniques uh, for a bone bridge uh, meniscus allograft. And I intend to uh, use the uh, bridge and slot technique, which you see as the image on the right. I think it's the most forgivable compare, uh, compared to some of the other available approaches. So to go step by step, um, we do our standard diagnostic arthroscopy in preparation of the remnant meniscus as we discussed. We'll then create an accessory portal and arthrotomy oriented in line with the anterior and posterior horns you see here with the spinal needle. Through that uh, accessory arthrotomy, we're going to create a superficial reference slot using either a 4 millimeter burr or a 5 millimeter bone cutting shaver as you see here. That superficial reference slot connects the line between the anterior and posterior root attachments. And in that superficial reference slot with the instrumentation set that I like to use for this procedure, you will then hook a depth gauge uh, around the back of the uh, tibial plateau. This will confirm the, uh, the A to P size and will also set you up for the implantation of a guide pin that you're going to reference off that depth gauge. The guide pin is drilled uh, just through the posterior cortex. And over that guide pin, we're going to utilize an 8 millimeter cannulated reamer to create almost a keyhole setting like you see here on the image in the bottom center. We're going to convert that keyhole into our, our rectangular slot using a box chisel. And it's really important that you're careful not to injure the articular cartilage of the uh, femoral condyle with the sharp edges of the box chisel. 
Here's the final rectangular slot, which is eight millimeters in diameter and a centimeter in depth. And this is gonna basically allow for easy insertion of your seven millimeter bone bridge. So on the back table, uh, the allograft is being pre uh, prepared. As you see, the meniscus allograft comes attached to the hemi plateau. We'll then make our size measurements and use our uh, sagittal saw uh, to create this bone bridge um, that is going to slide easily through our seven millimeter uh, diameter uh, reference slot here. And we're gonna place a, a tagging and traction suture at the uh, junction of the posterior one-third and anterior two-thirds. This traction suture is gonna allow you to flip the meniscus allograft tissue under the condyle uh, upon insertion. So once we've got our, our rectangular slot prepared and our allograft is ready, we're gonna insert it through our arthrotomy and we'll then fix the bony portion utilizing a seven by 23 millimeter interference screw as you see here. It's important to place the screw central to the bone bridge to peripheralize the meniscus allograft in the uh, compartment you're treating. At this point, uh, we're gonna perform uh, our peripheral meniscus fixation and it's uh, vertical mattress sutures uh, with uh, an inside out approach as we discussed before using zone specific cannulas as you see here. So here's a video demonstration of a vertical mattress suture with an inside out approach uh, utilizing those zone specific uh, uh, aimers. So as you see here, uh, the long needle is, uh, is identified in the accessory approach uh, with the Henning retractor in here protecting the posterior neurovascular structures. For the most posterior aspect of uh, meniscus allograft uh, fixation, I like to use an all inside approach. I think it's uh, safer with respect to that, those posterior neurovascular structures you're trying to protect. So here's the final result with the meniscus allograft in place fixed with multiple vertical mattress sutures as you see here. So on the left is a final product uh, of our um, lateral meniscus transplantation implanted with a bridge and slot technique. And on the right is a second look uh, for a patient that we had to go in actually for a tear of the uh, other meniscus, of the medial meniscus. And if you didn't know that this was an allograft uh, meniscus on the lateral side, uh, you couldn't tell. And it's also a patient that we performed an osteochondral allograft of the condyle, which also looks pretty good. An additional technique, and one that I'll, I, will, I have been using more and more for my medial meniscus transplantations, especially those that are being performed with a concomitant ACL reconstruction, is a double bone plug technique. So the preparation of the allograft meniscus is, is as you see in the images on the left. So we'll utilize cannulated reamers to create uh, bone plugs at the uh, root sites, both anteriorly and posteriorly. Uh, at these root sites through the bone plug, we have uh, traction sutures that are placed. And then we'll similarly put a traction suture in that junction between the posterior one-thirds and two-thirds to allow for seating of the meniscus allograft. So with the double bone plug technique, you start off by creating a posterior tunnel at the posterior root attachment, as you see here. We'll then pass the, uh, the posterior uh, bone plug into position. We'll then fix the meniscus peripherally. And then through the anterior arthrotomy, we'll drill our anterior tunnel at the anterior root uh, attachment, implant that anterior bone plug, and fix it distally either over a bone bridge or utilizing a uh, cortical button or anchor. So here's a short video showing a double bone plug technique. So you see we have our ACL tibial drill guide allowing us to place a retro drill uh, at the posterior root attachment site. We'll then drill a uh, eight millimeter uh, wide tunnel to a depth of 12 millimeters, pass a shuttling suture. That shuttling sutures allow us to pull the traction stitch that's in the posterior bone plug, allowing us to seat that posterior bone plug in the tunnel. And then we're gonna progress with our uh, peripheral fixation going from posterior to anterior. Uh, once again, uh, vertical mattress sutures uh, using an uh, inside out technique with sutures placed on both the uh, superior and inferior surfaces for that balanced repair that we've been discussing. Here's the final product of our uh, medial meniscus allograft transplantation using a double bone plug technique. So we've got our posterior plugs, plug seated here, our peripheral fixation with vertical mattress sutures in inside out fashion. The most posterior aspect is fixed with all inside fixation. And then we fixed our anterior bone plug uh, through our accessory arthrotomy. With respect to the postoperative care and rehabilitation after an allograft transplantation, at the present time, there's no consensus on an appropriate protocol. This is something that we're actively working on. For our patients here at NYU, we typically have them toe-touch weight-bearing for two weeks. Uh, we then progress them to weight-bearing as tolerated with crutches.
They're in a uh, hinged knee brace for a total of six weeks. Uh, uh, after the first two weeks where it's locked in extension, we'll unlock it to zero to 90 degrees. And we want to avoid uh, weight bearing at flexion angles greater than 90 for two months to avoid shear stresses on the posterior aspect of our allograft meniscus tissue. The patients are allowed on the stationary bike at two months, and depending on the return of range of motion and quadriceps strength, we'll allow them back to treadmill jogging at three months and uh, return to athletic activities somewhere between six and nine months, depending on restoration of 90% strength compared to the contralateral side, uh, full painless range of motion, and, and no issues uh, with uh, treadmill jogging with respect to pain or post-activity swelling. So looking at the clinical outcomes, there have been an increasing number of studies published on allograft meniscus transplantation over the last number of years. Most, at, the, and at least initially, were relatively uh, small with respect to N, and there was a r relatively large variability with respect to the results reported. Just to give you a little taste of uh, what's been published in this study out of Rush, published in 2006, uh, with uh, 44 patients at, at a mean age of 31 years, there was significant improvement in all measured parameters compared to the preoperative baseline. Almost 90% of the patients were satisfied at their clinical outcome at the time of final follow. In this study out of Pittsburgh, uh, they had 25 patients treated with, uh, treated with lateral meniscus allograft transplantation, and at a mean follow-up of more than three years, just about 80% had normal to near normal ratings on their IKDC functional scoring uh, outcome scores, and 96% uh, reported improved symptoms and function compared to their preoperative baseline. An important aspect of this study is that on pre, uh, pre, compared to the preoperative radiographs, their postoperative radiographs obtained at time, time of final follow-up showed no evidence of progressive joint space narrowing. In 2011, Elatar uh, published a meta-analysis of 44 uh, trials looking at meniscus allograft transplantation that included more than 1,000 grafts and 1,000 patients. At a mean follow-up of almost five years, there were significant improvements in uh, VAS pain scores and Lyshone functional scores, uh, and almost 90% of the patients were satisfied with their clinical outcome. It's important to note that the improvements noted did diminish over time in this meta-analysis, but overall the data allowed the authors to conclude that meniscus allograft transplantation can be considered as safe and reliable for the treatment of refractory post-menisectomy symptoms in selected patients. With respect to returning to athletics, uh, in this study by Cole and colleagues, they looked at 13 patients uh, at either the high school, collegiate, or professional athletic level, and at more than three years of follow-up, just about 80% returned to their desired level of play. Significant improvements were seen with respect to their Lysho, MyKDC, and Coup scores, but it's important to note that three revision procedures were performed for an incidence of 23%. This included a revision meniscus transplantation, a uh, partial metastectomy of the allograft, and a repair of a torn meniscus allograft. So to kind of pull it all together, meniscus tears are going to continue to be the most common knee pathology that we're going to see and treat as sports medicine specialists. What I've hopefully gotten across is that you should do your best to treat older patients with degenerative tears non-operatively, but if they continue to have symptoms after a trial of an intraarticular corticosteroid injection and uh, Post uh, and a formal physical therapy, a surgery can provide them with significant improvements. If you are going to proceed with surgery in the setting of meniscus pathology, you want to minimize meniscectomy whenever possible and be aggressive on repairing tears whenever you can. What we've hopefully also gotten across is that symptomatic meniscus insufficiency in a young patient can be a common scenario and a difficult problem to manage. We know that left alone, there's a poor natural history of the meniscectomized knee. And the data that's present in our current literature indicates that meniscus allograft transplantation can relieve pain and improve function, and it does so by restoring more normal load distribution in the affected compartment. Whether or not an allograft uh, slows, or, uh, slows or prevents the development or progression of osteoarthritis is yet to be proven, uh, but the early studies are, are promising. In the near future, I think the focus is going to be on uh, joint preservation surgery, combining meniscus surgery with cartilage repair procedures and osteotomies. And we need to really examine closely the alteration in postoperative management for these combined procedures. Also on the horizon are a number of synthetic graft options uh, for treating uh, significant prior meniscectomies or segmental meniscus tears. And we are currently working on a number of different augments to improve the success rate of meniscus repair by improving uh, the rate of peripheral healing. So hopefully
This was a, a, a bit of a whirlwind um, review of meniscus tear treatment uh, that you got some benefit out of. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions on the content that's been presented. Thank you.